so sangamitra bandopadhyay joined the machine intelligence unit of isi in calcutta as a faculty member after completing her phd from the same institute 1999 she is currently the director of the institute her, that institute isi her areas of research interest include computational biology bioinformatics soft and evolutionary computation pattern recognition and data mining in these areas she has published more than 300 research articles in various journals conferences and edited volumes she has published six authored and edited books from publishers like springer world scientific and wiley sangamitra has worked in various universities and institutes worldwide including us australia germany france italy china slovenia and mexico and delivered several invited lectures in, in many more countries she received uh, practically all the awards possible in the country but nagar award infosys award uh, infosys prize twice twas prize dbt national women bioscientist award inae silver jubilee prize young scientist engineer medals of insa inae and science congress the jc bose fellowship and the swarn jayanti fellowship she is a fellow of insa inae nasi and also the ieee she is currently a member of the prime minister's snt and innovation advisory council may i request professor bandopadhyay to present her lecture a very good afternoon and thank you very much for the introduction uh, i'm really delighted <coughs> to be uh, in iisc today uh, and that i got this opportunity to ad address the gathering here uh, first of all i would like to thank uh, infosys Uh, foundation for having considered me for this award and also for facilitating this talk here today and in particular professor narahari who took uh, care of every aspect <coughs> of my visit here uh, and anyway coming to iisc is always a delight it's always a privilege uh, a top institute of the country and institute i think that all of us as indians are truly proud of so thank you very much for having me here today i i'm going to speak on this topic which is close to my research uh, uh, close to my heart computational insights <clears throat> into the role of microRNAs in cancer as you can see i come from indian statistical institute i think another institute that we are truly proud of let me just first briefly introduce my institute to you i mean many of you would know but for those who may not be aware uh, much <clears throat> this is prashant chandra mahalanobis who founded the institute uh, way back in 1931 uh, he is very well known for his con uh, for his mahalanobis distance the d square statistic uh, his pioneering contributions in large scale sample surveys flood research and many other uh, results he was also uh, Made, he also made a major contribution by spearheading the <clears throat> second five year plan for the country uh, during this plan period actually the system of iits and the iim started in the country uh, a visionary of sorts got the first computer uh, in india to indian statistical institute in 1956 and of course one of his <clears throat> lasting contributions is this founding of this institution in 1931 which started uh, in a one room laboratory in presidency college in kolkata uh, and now it has moved to its present campus which is much large uh, quite large and multi city <coughs> uh, molinobis molinobis himself was a physicist by training and uh, he actually studied and also taught in presidency college till he superannuated but it was a chance interaction with uh, statistics that happened during one of his trips from europe to uh, india uh, that he read a few journals uh, and also after coming to india he was uh, he was exposed to certain problems of data analysis and which led him to believe to really understand that statistics is an important discipline for national development and human welfare and therefore uh, he along with the core group of people started this institution and right now <coughs> we are present in 10 different cities of the country the headquarters is in kolkata the centers in delhi bangalore chennai and tejpur and besides that we have a branch in giridi <coughs> and uh, sqc statistical quality control units in mumbai pune coimbatore and hyderabad 
<coughs> we have seven academic divisions besides the theoretical statistics and mathematics division. We have applied statistics, biological sciences, computer and communication sciences, social sciences, physics and earth sciences, <coughs> and statistical quality control and operations research. We give two undergraduate degrees, only two, <coughs> the uh, BSTAT and BMath. BSTAT happens in Kolkata and BMath happens in Bangalore. And we actually have the Bangalore head right sitting here. Um, and uh, several master's program, the MSTAT, MMath, MTech in computer science, uh, master of science in quantitative economics, and a few other. Our economics department is also very strong, both in Delhi and in Kolkata. And we have a few postgraduate uh, diploma programs, of which there is a very unique program which is launched about uh, third year running now, <coughs> which is a postgraduate diploma in business analytics, where three institutions sign, uh, ISI, uh, IIM Calcutta, and IIT Kharagpur. So this has become uh, a very popular program now. And of course, primarily, it's uh, research uh, programs in the institute. So with that brief introduction to the Indian Statistical Institute, let me go on to the, to the topic of my talk today. And uh, you see, when I studied biology in school, I was really terrified of biology. Uh, so any time I gave for an exam, I went for an examination, I would come back telling, assuring my mother the next time that exam would be better. So the first opportunity I got of leaving biology, I left it. Uh, but thereafter, uh, well into my uh, faculty career, career as a faculty, I got a student who wa was good in computers and wanted to do a project with me, but he had a background in biology and got me interested in a small molecule <coughs> which was being studied and is is, is, it is still studied quite a bit now, which are called microRNAs, and told me that the methodologies that we develop has a lot of application in biology and therefore I should look at these problems. And that's how again I went back to biology. Of course, it was very difficult for me to remember even the terms. So I will just start with the basics of molecular biology to refresh your memory if you have forgotten or if you were not as terrified as me of biology in your younger days. So <coughs> some very basic terms which uh, would be required during this presentation. So as we know, if you think of a cell, a, a typical eukaryotic cell would have a nucleus inside the nucleus. We have the genetic material in the DNA. Uh, most, in most of the times, the DNA would be really like a ball of wool, okay, wrapped all together. Uh, the picture, pictures that we see of chromosomes like this, in humans we have 22 pairs of autosomes and a pair of sex chromosomes, chromosome. So <coughs> uh, that happens only, th that differentiation between uh, the, th those shapes, that happen only before cell division happens. But in general, it's like a ball of wool. And uh, if you take out, say, uh, from the pair of chromosomes, uh, one pair, if you take out one of that pair and you look at it deeper, it's a double strand, okay? And you look deeper, this double strand, each of those strands, you can represent it um, as a sequence of four characters, A, T, C, and G, okay? And one strand, which is shown here, for example, uh, is the complement of the other strand. What do we mean by the complement? If we find an A here, we'll find a T there. If we find a C here, we'll find a G there. So that is how, because of bond formations, that's how uh, <coughs> the pairing happens. So this strand is the complement of this strand. Let's look at one strand now, one of these strands. That is in the famous uh, Watson and Crick um, double helix model. So if you look at one strand, and we take uh, one strand each from every chromosome, then if you lay it out, that is the genome. Mm, that long strand is the genome and typically human genome is of the order of 3 billion bases long. Okay? So 3 billion characters, let's say. And not everything is a gene. We, we speak of gene, but only certain portions, uh, they are genes. So let's look at this strand of the DNA, uh, this portion of the DNA as a gene. So uh, why it is a gene? Because it will be responsible for the production of a protein. Okay? So it will uh, lead to the production of this protein through do two different transformations. One is called transcription, which results in the formation of a, a messenger RNA. This letter M is for messenger, messenger and messenger meaning carrying a message, message for the corresponding protein. And through another 
transformation uh, through another uh, process called translation, the protein is formed, which is a sequence of amino acids. So, this is a sort of a structure of a, pro a secondary structure of a protein where you can see certain you know uh, helices, uh, these are called uh, the alpha uh, beta sheets, uh, and the remaining are random coils. So, this is a typical protein, and proteins are like all important. Everywhere you think of any cellular process, you think of there are proteins which are playing critical roles there. But anyhow, so from the DNA, we finally land up in the, uh, to the protein. This is the central dogma of molecular biology uh, <coughs> through processes called transcription and translation. What happens is very uh, sometimes uh, the process stops after this, after transcription. Okay? So, then what you get is an RNA. It may not be messenger RNA, it is not a messenger RNA, but some RNA. And uh, the, the topic that I am going to speak on, micro RNA, that is one type of small RNA. That is why this term micro, meaning the size is very small, and it is an RNA molecule in the sense that from the micro RNA gene through transcription, we will get the micro RNA and thereafter, thereafter nothing more. Okay, so, that is where uh, it, the process stops. So, these are endogenous molecules, meaning it is created inside the cells, very small as you can see 21 to 23 nucleotides, the mature micro RNA would be only this much long. And it has a very interesting role in that it, it uh, uh, regulates the expression of other genes. What do we mean by the expression of other genes? I will come to that. But what has, what has been found is that uh, micro RNAs play critical roles in many biological processes and is heavily in implicated in many, many different types of diseases, including almost in almost all types of cancer. Micro RNAs, their levels have are, they become dysregulated, either going up or going down. Something is happening to the micro RNA and that is, that is observed in almost all types of cancer. But how is the micro RNA working? So, as you can see, this is the normal pathway the protein coding gene here, a transcription, the messenger RNA is formed, it comes out of the nucleus and uh, had this, this thing not been there, then it would have produced its protein through, through translation. But what happens is that in the same uh, genome, I mean somewhere, there is a micro RNA gene which is act, becomes active and then the mature micro RNA comes out of the nucleus and it forms a complex with some proteins and the complex is called risk micro RNA complex which goes and either it degrades the messenger RNA or it just attaches itself to the messenger RNA and represses the translation. Essentially what is happening is this protein is not getting produced. Okay. So, that is what the micro RNA is doing essentially. So, it is targeting some messenger RNA. Uh, very often this is necessary, this is important because this, uh, this repression is needed, but sometimes if if a wrong micro RNA gets on because of some reason, it gets active or a correct micro RNA which should have been active gets silenced because of another reason, then things go wrong, things start going wrong. What is one example of things going wrong is, suppose this protein is an apoptotic protein in the sense that it plays a critical role in cell killing, cell killing is apoptosis. So, if it is such a protein that it is important for cell killing and cell killing is necessary because cells are dividing and therefore cells need to be killed, which is a normal process. Because unless the cell is killed, it will be an uncontrolled cell division, which is nothing but cancer. And now some micro RNA comes and actually uh, interferes with the production of such a protein, then what happens is you do not get that protein anymore and therefore cells are dividing but not getting killed, which is uh, the root, one of the root causes of the disease of cancer. Uh, so, that is how micro RNAs become important and play important roles. So, we did a study quite some time back of what was this cancer micro RNA network and this holistic study actually gave us important insights into which micro RNAs were involved in many different types of cancers, which my, so those were like hub micro RNAs, which micro RNAs were not hub, but they were actually key players in controlling the hubs and so on and so forth. So, this gave us some interesting insights, but what we thereafter got interested is in was this transcription factor micro RNA gene interaction network. So, this part like transcription factors interacting with genes. So, what are transcription factors? Uh, see, if you take the genome 
from any cell of the body, okay, take it from the heart tissue or liver or skin or anywhere. The genome that the long string, 3 billion base long string will be the same, okay, the, the sequence of characters is the same. In that case, the question comes, why is the behavior different in different, uh, different organs of the body, okay, why is the behavior different? Because it's the situation is more or less like this, you have many rooms with the same set of lighting, same set of bulbs and everything, but it is not that in every room you will have the same set of lights on. There are switches and because of those switching mechanics, because of the switches some lights are on, some lights are off. That is exactly what is happening. Each gene has a switching mechanism and one of the primary switches of the gene is the transcription factor, which is a protein. So this transcription factor, so there is a gene here, this transcription factor for switching on that gene will come and sit somewhere upstream of the gene which is a particular region typically called the promoter region. So, it will come and sit upstream of the gene and it will, uh, I mean it is not as simple as that, but it will, uh, it will play a major role in turning on this gene. Turning on this gene would mean that this gene will express itself, meaning it will produce the messenger RNA. Now, if this transcription factor is not present, then of course, this gene will, it is sitting there, but it will remain silent. Now, this transcription factor, if you recall, I said that it was a protein. So, if it is a protein, then it is also produced from some other gene in that same long strand. So, that gene which produces the transcription factor is in effect controlling this gene and if you look at it in a very comprehensive uh, fashion, you will find that there is a complex gene regulatory network which is in action. So, this part was quite well studied, okay. The gene regulatory network is, I mean it is being, being studied even uh, these days, but it was already well studied. But what came in as a new player was this microRNA, because microRNA was also controlling genes at a post transcriptional level. So, microRNAs, now one, we wanted to look at that if we integrate the microRNAs into this regulatory network, what happens? What is the new information that we may get? So, we plugged in this microRNA here so, and essentially we were, pre we were interested in two uh, uh, main computational methods here also. One is predicting which microRNA would target which gene or actually it targets not the gene, but the messenger RNA at a post transcriptional level. Uh, so, which micro RNA which would target which messenger RNA? This could be here, this could also that messenger RNA could also be responsible for formation of a transcription factor that would both ways target prediction. That was the typical target prediction and the method we developed was target minor. And see micro RNA, there are uh, micro RNA is also present as a micro RNA gene in that long strand. So, therefore, somebody must be responsible for turning on or turning off that microRNA gene also just like a normal gene. So, what are the transcription factors which are responsible for turning which regulate microRNAs essentially that is what we wanted to also figure out. And typically the way that is done is for given a microRNA you try to predict from where ahead of that microRNA will the transcription start. So, that is called the transcription start site prediction. Now, if we can predict the transcription start site, then given that small subsequence which corresponds to the start site of the transcription, you can then predict which transcription factors might come and bind there. So, that would give an indication that these transcription factors are possibly regulating this microRNA gene. So, we were doing that as well. This uh, is uh, reported in PUT MIR, putative transcription factors for microRNAs. So, microRNA regulation by transcription factors. So, uh, we were uh, concentrating on these two and thereafter we concentrated on the entire network. So, very quickly to go over uh, these two uh, techniques that we had developed, the transcription start site prediction. Now, you see transcription start site prediction was also, it is also a problem for normal genes, not microRNA genes only, but also for normal genes. You want to find out for a gene, what is the transcription factor which regulates this gene and therefore, you would like to find out what are the transcription start site for that gene. Now, we thought that why not use the, the method for normal transcription start site prediction for no other genes, normal genes, Let, why not use it for predicting transcription start sites for microRNAs. We did it and the results were not very encouraging because there was some validated information. The results, I mean it was not a high classification accuracy. So, then uh, we thought that training on a gene uh, se uh, uh, sequence upstream of the gene and there might be different signatures upstream of the microRNA, the signatures might be different. It is not that the same signature which has been trained, the classifier is trained on that signature for 
uh, gene transcription start site would work for microRNA. G signatures probably are different, so we used a different uh, tra training set and we trained on microRNA data and then tested and of course then the results were much better leading us to believe that there is a difference uh, in the signatures. Of course, we also did some contributions in the feature extraction, feature selection and classification part. But uh, without going into this, what I want to just show you that we compared with certain validated information also and the numbers in the brackets, they show how far the predicted location is from the validated uh, location, known location. And you can see the numbers given the lengths that uh, we typically talk of in uh, genomic scales that these are pretty close. Okay. So, once you have a good prediction of the transcription start site, then of course, you can figure out what are the transcription factors which are potentially regulating this. The code is of course, uh, freely available, but at the same time, the database of putative transcription factors for microRNAs is also uh, available for anybody to use and it is quite uh, well you used. The other thing that I want to just uh, draw your attention to is uh, the contribution that we made in microRNA target prediction. So, what is the target? Some messenger RNA. For a given microRNA and a messenger RNA pair, we would like to say whether this microRNA targets this messenger RNA or does not target. So, it is a two level classification problem essentially and what is the data? Data is a pair, microRNA, mRNA pair and from that we would like to predict whether this will target this or will not target this. So, when we started looking at this, we already found several algorithms which were existing including some machine learning based methods which were already out there and we first applied these methods and the results were remarkably different. Okay. So, three different methods would get three different uh, set, set of predicted targets. The machine learning methods also, I mean the disparity was quite evident. So, uh, we started looking why this, what is the problem and then we realized that when they were training, the training data uh, actually there was a remarkable lack of negative data set because for training a classifier you would like both a positive data set as well as a negative data set. Now, when the biologist is exp experimenting uh, he or she thinks that this micro RNA may target this messenger RNA and is trying it out in the laboratory and it works. So, they report ok, yes I found a target, I validated a target, but when it does not work they do not report, most of the time they do not report. And therefore, that is the negative data that, that we need that I have tried this messenger RNA micro RNA messenger RNA pair, tried seeing if it is targeting this or not, it did not work out. So, that was the negative data we needed, but which is only very few negative data was actually available. And therefore, what these machine learning about these methods which relied on negative data set as well, what they were doing is they were you know generating artificial artificially the negative data set. And this artificially generated negative data set was quite remarkably different from the true uh, negative data and in fact from the true positives. So, true positive data and the artificially generated neg negative data were artificially quite different from each other. And therefore, during training the classification training of the classifier was very easy, quite easy nice uh, training results, but when it was uh, tested it started failing and the results were also quite different. So, what we then realized is we need a very strongly curated negative data. Okay. So, that is what the was the main contribution here to get a set of negative data which is biologically very plausible and to do that what essentially the philosophy we followed is we took some standard prediction algorithms microRNA target prediction algorithms and took their predictions and took a union of those predictions. So, these were all predicted positives. Uh, okay. So, all three methods um, uh, we took these three methods. So, they are predicted targets and from those predicted targets we started removing those pairs which had a e had even a remote chance of being a true positive. Okay. So, there were many many different filters which we used and these were all based on other data sets for the same samples which are available and we started removing from that predicted target set. So, you see we are taking a predicted positive and from there we are extracting the negative data. So, anything that had a remotely uh, uh, chance, the remote chance of being a true positive was removed and then we were stuck with, uh, we were left with a set of uh, a smaller set of data set, a smaller data set 
which we then did some other validation studies to uh, figure out how truly negative it could be and finding the results quite good we actually did our classifier training we did of course feature selection the same pipeline selecting features and then we added some new features on our own and um, then doing feature selection and classification we use the support vector machine classifier nothing great about that so uh, and uh, uh, we did some further studies and finally we compared it with many of the methods almost all the methods which were there at that point of time and uh, this this plot actually shows very interestingly that target minor the proposed method as well as some one existing method target scan that was doing reasonably well in the sense that it had a low false positive rate as well as a high true positive rate so doing pretty well methods are over here they were like um, very uh, what should I say very liberal in the sense that they were trying to predict everything as positive therefore had high true positives and high false positives. So, the methods here were very um, conservative I would say <coughs> meaning they were unwilling to predict unwilling to make mistakes and therefore unwilling to even predict true positives. So, uh, but this had a nice balance. So, uh, in fact this method once we published uh, became very popular and uh, we also published the genome uh, genome wide targets of uh, human microRNAs and this there's a there's a database called mirbase which uh, has a lot of information about microRNAs and also predicted targets by three four different methods and uh, they found this method to be quite useful and therefore they have indexed the predictions of target minor also in mirbase so among tar uh, target scan has been indexed there so, our method also got into that database the predictions. So, genome wide predictions of our method also got into the database. So, this uh, we also found that many people were using target minor and also many people were, were they were not using target minor they were using their favorite classifiers, but they were using our negative data. So, that proved to be very useful at least I mean now there are the more availability of negative data is there, but at that point there was very few uh, such validated negatives and therefore, this negative data played a major role in improving the classifier performance. So, <coughs> what we did thereafter if you recall, we were interested in that transcription factor microRNA gene regulatory network ok. And uh, what we uh, did was if we are looking only because ideally it should work on that network should be built on things that are validated. But if we are only concentrating on validated information the net network is very sparse. So, we need to have more uh, uh, information there in the network and therefore, uh, because all our classifiers were they were also assigning confidence scores on the classification results accuracy uh, on the classification results. So, we took the high confident uh, results predictions and we uh, figure put that in in the network ok. So, using our target minor the high prediction uh, high confi highly confident predictions were incorporated in the uh, transcription factor microRNA gene regulatory network as well as the transcription start site thing the putative transcription factors. So, these are not validated. So, we must take uh, I mean accept it with a pinch of salt, but these were very highly we were quite confident that this could be potential uh, candidates. So, now we had this network ok and a, a more comprehensive network than what was there uh, uh, earlier. Uh, we call this the transcription factor microRNA network TMG network and actually that gave us very interesting uh, insights and also some things which uh, people were not looking at at that point of time which was that you see my everybody was looking at what is a microRNA targeting. But if you think a little bit a microRNA also has secondary regulations in the sense the microRNA may be targeting and does target at the primary level some messenger RNA, but at the secondary level a microRNA may be controlling another microRNA because through that transcription factor it may be controlling another microRNA. So, these microRNA to microRNA regulations which are now common knowledge people I mean we were almost the first one of the first groups to start looking at that and therefore, uh, at that point of time this work uh, actually attracted a lot of attention and we got a lot of calls for coming and presenting and things like that. So, anyhow uh, this, uh, but you can imagine I mean it is not possible to build a general purpose network right I mean there is nothing called a general it is tissue specific 
there are certain uh, transcription factors, certain genes which are on in tissues, in certain tissues. Okay. Therefore, you have to study it tissue wise. Okay. You cannot have a general purpose for the entire uh, system. So, we were looking at breast cancer and colorectal cancer. Uh, and we had this big network, we looked at its uh, also other properties also, the network properties uh, and other things. But we also analyzed and uh, used this method here to uh, analyze this network and we got this hierarchical structure. Most of the candidates here are either transcription factors or uh, microRNAs and things like that. And this hierarchical structure at the top level, we came up with, we could find that there were five molecules up there. And these five molecules in case of breast cancer all happen to be microRNAs, indicating to us the importance of uh, the fine tuning that these microRNAs uh, were doing. Okay? So, something goes wrong here affects a lot of other things. So, uh, what we were then interested in is looking at these microRNAs to figure out was anything known in the literature about them or not. So, we found out, the f out of the five, there were three microRNAs where there was sufficient literature evidence that these are oncoMIRs were uh, quite well known to be involved in breast cancer. But about two, we at least at that point, there was no, not much, no, no information available. So, it turned, therefore, the natural question is are these important? Somebody has to look and say that these are important. We did not have that expertise, but in fact, one of them has been validated independently by an indep other group, another group later on. And very recently, I was just curious and uh, looking up about this thing, more information is now started coming in on this microRNA as well for breast cancer. Similar results we obtained for <coughs> colorectal cancer also. Again, we had an analyzing this network, we have this structure and uh, there are five molecules here of which there are two which are transcription factors and three which are microRNAs. Since we were interested in looking at microRNAs, we looked further and uh, sure enough, we found quite a lot of evidence for two of them, but the third, we did not find any evidence. So, this is a potential biomarker because it is very important to figure out new, I mean biomarkers which give an indication of the disease. And often genetic markers, uh, that uh, it is very important to figure out what the genetic markers are uh, in order to even design therapies. Okay? So, not only is it indicative of the disease, but ca can also play a major role in designing therapies for that disease. Overall, what we felt is that when we were looking at, let us say this is the uh, breast cancer specific network and this was uh, sort of um, the, the data and this is the colorectal cancer data. We were looking at only the trans transcription factors which are known to be dysregulated there and you can see there is not much connectivity here. So, they are like uh, uh, islands, but once you plug in the microRNAs, you can immediately see that there is a lot of crosstalk which is possible and it was same here and here. Uh, leading us to believe that microRNAs, as I said, they are not major tuners, right? I mean, transcription factors are the main things which are tuning things here and there, I mean, uh, at a larger scale. But these are, at a minor scale, they are adjusting levels and they are very important. So, uh, that was our overall conclusion. We, of course, uh, took the studies forward, um, but I mean, it would not be, I mean, uh, it is difficult to explain everything here. So, uh, I just want to tell you about some other uh, results from our group uh, which has come in, uh, which is uh, like we have done a se series of contributions in clustering as well as by clustering of different data sets including gene expression data and that was the, that was the easiest for me to get into uh, computational biology because I was already working in clustering with techniques for optimization, which we had our own techniques for uh, multi-objective optimization. We had already posed the, multi, uh, the clustering problem as a problem of multi-objective optimization. So, a typical multi-objective problem optimization problem is where you have multiple objectives, these objectives uh, conflict with each other, meaning if you improve one, the other will become bad and so on and so forth. And the typical approach for solving multi-objective optimization problem is you join all of them together uh, in a weighted average. And then you have a single objective and you apply your favorite optimization method. But there are some problems with that. Uh, so, 
multi objective optimization uh, the meta heuristics which are out there like based on genetic algorithms or simulated annealing uh, or differential evolution these have a different way of looking at it they do pareto optimization so uh, if you have a single objective optimization your target is to improve that single point as much as you can but in pareto optimization what you do you have a, a surface which you want to have. this is a trade off surface essentially and this surface is what you try to improve as much as possible so at the end in a typical multi objective optimization problem which uses a pareto based approach you will land up with a set of solutions and in fact in clustering when we use multi objective clustering we had uh, we proposed a nice way i thought it was quite elegant way of you know so we had several different solutions and each solution gives one clustering of that same data and we suggested an elegant way of combining these results in a supervised fashion so we could move from an unsupervised classification problem which clustering is to a supervised classification problem where we applied a classifier we used support vector machine but it was very elegant way of uh, combining all the uh, solutions to get a supervised uh, in a supervised framework to get a single clustering solution and this happened to outperform all the uh, the what should i component clustering solutions uh, so that was quite interesting we also came up with a measure <coughs> for computing uh, similarity between two uh, expression data sets in fact so uh, expression data uh, can be of different types including a one type where it is the variation of expression over time so you have genes on this just think of genes on the rows and time points on the columns and uh, every value there will give you gene i at time point t the time point could be let's say cell division has started okay just at the start of cell division a little later a little later and so on or you have taken a medicine just before you take a medicine expression of the gene uh, after taking a med um, uh, two minutes after taking the medicine this half an hour after taking the medicine this so expression of genes meaning the level of the micro number of micro rnas in effect they are not constant over time they go up and down over time in the morning it will be something in the evening it will be some other thing with age it will change so it uh, it will vary and you can think once you understand the domain a little bit then it becomes just a time series data for you okay you can forget whether it's a stock data or a micro rna expression data time series uh, expression data but it's just becomes a an uh, a time series data for you and typically pearson correlation coefficient or some other measure is used to measure the di distance between two time series euclidean distance will often not work well there but we found that uh, at least in the biological domain even the the mm, the correlation coefficient uh, um, there were certain problems with that therefore we came up with a biological inspired measure this uh, is uh, a fast optimal global sequence alignment algorithm in biology you can see there are sequences everywhere okay dna is a sequence of atcgs rna sequence is a sequence of aucg protein is a sequence of um, amino acids so this there are multiple sequences at multiple levels and very often you have to do sequence alignment that is putting uh, let's say two sequences one over the other such that you have uh, matchings in maximum number of positions and there you are allowed to insert gaps that's all you can you can just stretch the sequence a little that's all so there at a global level there's a, a global uh, uh, an optimal algorithm but <coughs> it uh, you i mean for large sequences it was impossible to apply these algorithms so we came up with the optimality was maintained yet it was much faster this is very interesting a recent work that we have published in uh, nucleic acids research uh, see at uh, when we were taking expression data or gene expression uh, gene expression data essentially what is happening suppose uh, there is um, cancer somewhere on the skin okay or an uh, oral cancer is very common in india because of tobacco chewing habit so you, person has oral cancer you take you scrape off some skin uh, from some tissues from the cancerous region so from uh, once uh, from the diseased region and this has a number of cells right large number of cells and then <coughs> <coughs> so when you do expression analysis what you are essentially getting <coughs> is a value which is averaged over all these large number this large number of cells but tumor tissues are very heterogeneous okay they are at different stages of uh, disease progression okay they are very different from each other 
but what we get in expression data in the typical expression data is an average value where the individual variations are lost. But technology has now improved where you can look at even single cell RNA seq data, okay, single cells, okay. And this is these are quite big data sets because you have so many cells and so many genes uh, to look at. A human being will typically have 20 to 25,000 genes. So you can imagine the dimensionality of the data. Uh, clustering here is okay, you, uh, it's like a high dimensional data clustering problem, also large data. But uh, the important thing here is that you see there will be very small, uh, only a few cells making one cluster, okay, rare cells. That is, it's very important that the clustering algorithm is able to detect even those small clusters, which um, it, usually what will happen, a clustering algorithm will join it with a larger cluster. So, uh, that uh, rare cluster or rare cell detection is also one characteristic of this method, drop cluster. Then we worked on host pathogen uh, interaction, protein protein interaction network. Uh, typically, we focused on HIV and human. Uh, <coughs> we also, as I said, this was something that uh, we were talking of for the first time and that caught a lot of attention microRNA to microRNA secondary regula uh, regulations. And uh, very, uh, this was an interesting thing, um, uh, rational drug design, we, were, we posed it as a problem of multi-objective optimization and used our favorite method of multi-objective optimization. So uh, typically what happens is uh, the disease pathway is studied, what are the molecules which are there in the disease pathway and you identify a suitable target for the drug uh, to go and hit that target. So and the suitable target is often a protein. And protein, if you uh, can imagine, it is a, essentially a three-dimensional molecule which is not very smooth. It has its own clefts and cavities and those are the, some of these cavities are important because that is where the action happens. Other molecules come and bind there, okay. And these are called active sites. Those, those places or cavities where things are happening, that is called the active sites. So, the, typically the drug uh, molecule would go and, uh, so there is a harmful uh, binding which is happening because of which the disease is happening and a typical drug molecule will go and sit in that active site. That is how most of these drug molecules work by targeting uh, those active sites of the target protein and sitting there before that harmful binding takes place, thereby sort of hoping that the disease would be cured. Uh, so, uh, so essentially our task was to, we assume that the protein, target protein is known each and every uh, step of this process is of course a research direction by itself. So the we assume that the target protein is known, its active site is also known and now we want to design a small molecule from scratch, okay, uh, which will go and sit there nicely. So it must have several properties, this small molecule. First of all, it should be, it should be stable itself. I mean you try to synthesize it, it just flies off, that cannot happen. And uh, a system is stable when energy is minimized. So. Uh, there are ways of computing energy of this small molecule which one target is to minimize that energy. This binding, this binding should also have several properties. First of all, the interaction energy between the small molecule and the surface amino acids of the protein, that energy should also be minimized, then the binding will be stable. Then there are electrostatic considerations, okay. If you have a positive charge here and your molecule also has a positive charge, then of course it will not go in. Uh, even if it goes in, it will go away. So different considerations. Finally, some considerations like the small molecule that you design, if it has to be a drug molecule, first of all it cannot be very heavy because then it will not, uh, the cell will not take it up, okay. And then it cannot be toxic and things like that. So there are different ways of uh, quantifying uh, these properties. One cannot claim that uh, we have looked at all possible properties, it is not possible, we do not even have that expertise. But we looked at as many as we could by talking to experts and then we ran a multi-objective optimizer on this and designed small molecules. So that was the ra rational drug design problem. Of course, uh, the important thing that uh, needs to be done, needs to be look in, looked into here is most of these potential lead molecules, potential mo mo molecules which could potentially lead to drug molecules fail at different levels of testing. And the primary reason for failure is, although you might have put in a lot of intelligence in designing that small molecule which will come and fit here. But what happens is the small molecule fits here nicely but also fits elsewhere, okay. There are so many proteins, so many active sites of the proteins. It goes and sits in, in other cavities also, okay. And thereby uh, leading to all these side effects for drugs. And if the side effect is 
uh, is quite bad, then of course you, the drug molecule will have already failed its test. So, uh, I mean these optimizers or whatever, they need to have uh, you know mo molecules which are specific to an active site and does not have binding properties to off site lo I mean locations. It should stick here and nowhere else. So that needs a lot of lot of studies and we have uh, we have that in mind but we have not yet done done anything about that. People are also and biologists continue looking into all these things. So that was one thing which uh, we were quite happy. In fact, we were taking as target an HIV protein and uh, we dis uh, was it HIV or tuberculosis? I don't remember. I mean, uh, one of them. We have looked at both in fact. But what in one of them what was interestingly which what evolved is the method could uh, could design in the last we had the Pareto optimal surface. So, several molecules were actually the solution, not one single molecule, but several molecules. Some of these were actually very similar to existing molecules which are known to target that protein. Okay? So, there are database of molecules which are known whose targets are known. So, some of these molecules were very similar to those, giving us confidence on the method that possibly it was okay. And the others which were novel, which did not have much similarity with the existing molecules, those were those could be potential lead molecules for further studies. So, that is where our study of actually stopped. So, this is uh, just some a glimpse of what uh, we, I and my uh, entire team, we are a group has been doing over these years, over um, several years now. Uh, some references are here, which uh, quite a few, uh, but uh, some of my own papers are there. Uh, and of course, I would like to acknowledge Indian Statistical Institute uh, for for making me what I am today, uh, DST and DVT for generous funding uh, from them, the Alexander von, von Humboldt Foundation, Germany, ICTP Italy, I was there just um, a, a few days back. Uh, so, it is wonderful, I was just telling uh, Professor Narahiri here, the, the environment is so thriving, we have so many seating places and boards everywhere, chalks everywhere, uh, whiteboards everywhere, pen, uh, everything. Everything is there. You can just sit down anywhere and start discussing. So, uh, it's a nice thing. And Infosys Foundation, of course, for having considered me for uh, this award. And naturally, without whom, uh, it would uh, every, anything, nothing would be possible. My students and collaborators around the world. Thank you very much for your attention. We have some time for questions. Yes. yes. Yeah, please announce your name and make the question uh, short. Fulan Prasad, of course, last slide you answered quite a lot, but I would like to hear your comments on the relation between computational biology, the experimental one, and the effectiveness of the drug designs from the computational biology. Oh, uh, first of all, computational biology and experimental biology. Experimental biology cannot do without computational methods anymore. I mean, it's just not possible uh, because of the amount of data, the complexity of the data. Uh, so, what I say is that computational methods that we develop, uh, typically bioinformaticians, what they would do is they would use an existing method on biological data and get the biological insights. But being computer scientist myself, that wouldn't please me, right? I have to develop the method. So, the computational method and uh, try to develop methods which beat the state of the art which is out there. Uh, the point is the biologist is anyway looking at a needle in a very big haystack. Does not know where to start, where to look, where to end. It is so much of information. And what our methods do is reduce the size of the haystack. It still remains a haystack. But at least you have eliminated certain experiments which are most likely to land up in failures. Because earlier, suppose even for the drug design. Traditionally, how drugs were designed, they were just, I mean, by chance, uh, some uh, natural uh, uh, molecule worked, that is all. Then what people did is, was virtual screening, okay. You have a database of millions of molecules and you have potential targets, you just try and see, trial and error, trial and error. That is extremely expensive and most of the time it would lead to failures. Then came the principles of rational drug design. That why do you need to try everything? Because not, not everything will interact with everything else. So, apply rationality in trying even. So, that was the principle of rational drug design. That if, if the structure is like this square, a bigger circle will not fit in there. 
So that is, uh, look at the structural properties, geometrical properties, electrostatic properties, uh, thermodynamic properties, and then try. So don't look at everything. So that's how things happened. There is a statement which says, I don't know how true it is, but it says that in future will no longer be, uh, no longer be, uh, what is it? Um, no longer be just discovered. It will be designed on the computer. That's why, and uh, there are success stories of rational drug design, uh, design uh, drugs which have been designed based on these principles. And then, of course, uh, trial, you, you can reduce a lot of these design time. But the trial time is difficult too. You have to do animal trials, human trials, and things like that. Those things, I mean, it's very difficult to reduce. But without computational methods, nothing is going to work anymore. A computational methods have to be there. Eh? Everybody acknowledges that now. So there is no fight between computer science and biology anymore. But computer science, statistics, <laughs> mathematics, and <laughs> it is there at a high, very deep connection now. Okay, Kumar from microbiology and cell biology. There are two questions. One is related to TSS prediction for intergenic microRNA you mentioned. Intergenic, yeah. yes, we did it uh, for intergenic. Typically, uh, I, I do not know how often we have to predict uh, transcription start size. Tra typically, people clone the full RNA, cDNA, and do some uh, prior extension and all those things, identify. Uh, so, in the case of so microRNA, all you have to do is you have to you have to clone the primary microRNA and then uh, do the Absolutely. exercise. So it's from the and having said that, uh, now that we know the start site for almost all 20,000 coding genes, did you go and apply your algorithm in those genes? Did they work? Number one, Not number gene. we were looking at all the protein right? coding. No, no, the features of uh, transcription start size should be similar regardless of coding gene or non-coding gene. Okay, you could apply your uh, prediction algorithm to the protein coding genes for all of which we know the start site now. Yes. Okay. okay. Have you applied that? Uh, How did it work? Number one. Yes. Number two, uh, with respect to uh, target uh, minor, your uh, algorithm to predict uh, targets for microRNA. Uh, it's very interesting, you, you showed a ROC car, it works much, much better than any of the known algorithms, the including target scan, yes. which is supposed to be one of the very, very stringent programs which yes. utilizes a variety of features which other programs doesn't utilize. Um, you said one of the reasons why those things failed, yours uh, work much better, you were able to computationally predict negative data, yes. right? Yes. People uh, take the targets and do validation, whichever is positive, they mention it, whichever is negative, didn't get validated, they never not talk about it. Never talk about it, very rarely. You said you ma managed to computationally predict negative data. How did you do that? Did you apply all those genes which are coming in the target scan, low score, you no. consider as negative? No, no. And how did you able to predict those which are not I'll shown tell. experimentally as a negative data? How did you predict? I'll tell, I'll tell you. Yes. So first one was the transcription start site prediction, as I said, uh, we did the uh, opposite way, that is we looked at the transcription start site prediction methods for genes, uh, which quite a few were there, which we tried for microRNAs. And uh, when we did that, the results were not very encouraging on the validated microRNA information, but whatever was available. It was not very good predictor. So leading us to believe that you need different training, different, I mean the method could be the same, but you need different training data sets. This is all computation. Uh, computational. So then what we did was then we extracted um, the training data from a region upstream of the microRNA genes and these were intergenic because uh, intragenic it is usually believed that it shares the regulatory mechanism of the host gene. So that is why we were only looking at intergenic and this was done in brain tissues. So <coughs> uh, what we um, so, so we did extracted the training data from upstream of the microRNA genes and that is how we trained and then we applied on the microRNA uh, test data set when the results were quite much better than when we were uh, applying the methods which were trained on microRNA genes. <coughs> As I said, <coughs> leading us to believe that there is some difference in the signatures between these two start sites. So that was the first point of yours and the second was mm, negative data, oh yes negative data. So, uh, so he here it gives a sort of um, uh, how the negative data set was generated. So you can see we took the union of target scan, Miranda and Pictar. Uh, we took the predictions of these three and joined them all together. So this was all predicted positives. And then we started looking at other data sources. Uh, so typically we looked at expression data where 
suppose uh, there is some mic microRNA X which is pred uh, in this set, but one of these or maybe one more than one of these predicted that X targets Y. Okay? So, th that has come in the union set, but one uh, expression data tells me that if X is high, Y is also high. I would expect if X actually targets Y, then if X is high, then Y should be low. So, if we see that X is high and Y is low, then it has a chance to be a true positive, right? It may not be a true positive, but there is a chance that it can be a true positive that was removed. Uh, so, we actually plugged in now other sources of data, including some protein expression data to figure out that negative data set. So, and there were, uh, so that this was two stages of filtering beta based on expression data from other sources. So, if uh, the, this union set had said that X targeted Y and if an expression data actually supported that in some way that expression of X and Y both were uh, X was high Y was low then we removed that I mean because it may be a true positive. So, remove, remove that that was two stages of filtering then we looked at uh, the minimum free energy or whatever was left uh, which had some chance of being uh, stable that is less than even 0 kilocal per mole those were removed because they have a chance of being a stable um, set and finally, we looked at conservation scro scores across 17 species because uh, if it is a true target it will be conserved in general. So, we looked at conservation scores and whichever had uh, even a little bit of high score that was also removed. So, we sort of then removed whatever had even a, a very small chance of being a true positive. Nothing says that we do not know whether these whatever we have removed are really true positives. They may not be true positives, but because they showed some chance of being a true positive we removed it. So, what we were left with is a set then this set we also looked at the protein expression data that result is not there it is in the paper, but we looked at protein expression data for those uh, that was available. And we were reasonably confident that this is a good negative set better than whatever was out there. And uh, in fact, when we also trained our classifier, we used the standard training set which were negative data, data set which was uh, available as well as this negative data. This was uh, truly better I mean uh, with this negative data because you see it is it, it uh, this negative data shares po uh, characteristics of positive data set because that is why it has come up in the predicted target. So, it so essentially what we are getting is if there are two classes we are getting uh, data sets from the negative data from this overlapping region therefore, my boundary will be more faithful. Uh, so, generalization capability will be better if I have two classes which are here anything any boundary in between will be fantastic, but if we actually uh, the situation is something like this and we can get the boundary in the overlapping region that is better for the generalization capability of the classifier. So, I hope I <laughs> was able to answer, yeah, but sure. I could discuss more later. Yeah. I think there are two more questions. Uh, yeah. We will have time only for two more questions. Yes, of course. Features have been identified. I mean, we did have, uh, our uh, own feature selection also. So, features are known. How does it compare to physics? I do not know. That I cannot say. Structural physics, interaction structural interaction model. Um, how does it compare with structural yeah. interaction model? I will not be able to answer. Maybe I have to understand your question a little more before I can uh, tell you that. But uh, well, we could say that these features are important, but not more than that. I mean, uh, SVM does not allow too much of explanation. Uh, so, like uh, unlike decision trees, which says that this uh, feature is uh, the high, so and this is low, and this, that that is why this class is so and so. That explanation ability is uh, well. We did not really think of that too much. So we'll have the last. We'll have the last question. Yeah. Oh yes. But then I did not understand you come again what is the question? I mean to ask that for instance that is in vascular diseases as well as uh, the can, uh, can, uh, cancer for in these two scenario there are common my miRNAs also uh, identified as one of the targets. So, in that if if we come across such a miRNA how would we evaluate whether they are going to have half target effect 
which are more profound than detecting the disease or progress assessment in progress. So, you mean that there is a microRNA which is known to be involved or uh, plays important roles in more two than different in diseases, one disease. In two yes. different diseases, yes. cardiovascular and cancer. Yeah. So, then what do we do? What was your question about this microRNA? How so do we determine what? In those cases, how would we ensure the off target effect was over the, uh, the. What do you mean by off target effect here? Meaning off target like effect when I was talking about the rational drug design was of a different nature. Off target meaning this, uh, the small molecule that I, that we designed, that small molecule, this is neither a microRNA nor an mRNA, this is just a, a molecule, a, an inorganic mo molecule possibly, uh, which will uh, come and sit here, but it in this active site, but can also sit in other active sites. Okay. So, that has nothing to do with microRNA. So, do you mean off, that was where I was speaking of off target effects. Okay. But with microRNA, uh, what do you mean by off target effects? I no, I mean to say, ma'am, like when we have a target against particular uh, a particular uh, protein or enzyme in a particular pathway, mm -hmm. when we do a validation post computational data that we wanted to see is indeed is having an effect on the downstream processes that when we ca do that, but if the, ma if the information that we obtain is quite deviating from what we predicted much earlier on. In those cases, how do we uh, redesign our strategy to validate? Sure, I mean, this is, uh, and very often this is going to be happen, that what you predicted and what you thought would happen actually that doesn't happen. That is going to happen very, uh, that's very likely. Uh, well, we didn't look at what to do, but usually people then, there's a relevance feedback sort of thing which you can be uh, taken up that, uh, okay, so this uh, is, a prediction which happened because of this reason we predicted this that doesn't work but i cannot answer that way i mean offhand i'm just saying but uh, it needs a more, more thought like okay this didn't turn a uh, figure i mean <coughs> whatever you predicted whatever you thought it would do it is not doing that mm -hmm. then what is the i mean there must be a reason for why it is not doing that then you start again looking at that molecule what it is inter what are its interacting packed partners what is happening to those other pathways I mean, th that is the problem with the biological system that X and Y, you know what X does and you know what Y does, but when you put X and Y together, it does something totally different. So that is the problem. I mean, but even, uh, even in spite of all these challenges, there are success stories. There are, um, so uh, it is very difficult to answer and there will be hundreds of reasons why certain things are happening. Okay, so what, this pathway has been blocked. It will take some other alternate pathway and uh, I mean, the disease will not be cured. Because it is, uh, there's redundancy of path, I mean, it will take some other path to get, get to the same result. So, so there are challenges, of course. Uh, it is very difficult to say how this challenge can be, and there are multiple ways of handling these challenges, and not all is known also, but that is where a systems level approach becomes so important. So it is it, uh, it not uh, sufficient to study at a molecular level, but you have to look at the interaction, because it is, at the end, it is the system over there, everything interacting with everything else in a very, very small environment. So that is why systems biology, uh, at a systems level, you have to look at all the interactions. So let's, yeah. let's take the rest of the questions yeah. offline. Let's thank uh, Professor Sangamitra Bandopadhyay for a very informative talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to request uh, Professor Anurag Kumar to give a, a bouquet of flowers to